Happy Monday, everybody. Yo. Is this the uh, is it is it is this the Gex? It sounds Gecky. No, but you're right. It does. This is um uh, the new Monster Cat release. Uh, Stay by Tynan and Ace Aura. Definitely hey. seems fallen fallen from the uh, the 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 Gex tree. A little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Welcome home, Justin. Yeah, I was about to say. Oh family. my God. All together. Yeah. No. Uh, uh, I'm looking. I, 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 gone over a week. Uh, quarantined for six days locally. Um, two tests, one mail away and one rapid test, uh, but came out clean. Two two away trips, no COVID. Uh, very very happy. Nice, very good. Yeah, I saw your uh, I saw your tweet about your your negative test. That's great. Yeah, no, it was uh, uh you know I think pro forma at that point because you know I'd been Sorry. back for long enough that I would have expected to have some kind of uh, some kind of. Uh, a symptom yeah, like, closest symptom what, i had days? yeah yeah and even then the only like i tr i flew but even then like airplanes are statistically a very very unlikely place for you to get it uh the airports were totally empty and i had effectively quarantined the day before in atlanta the real the last like event i was at was uh, over a week ago or a week ago today so um but yeah it's uh Good to be home. Good yeah. to be home. Yeah. Um. All righty. Well. Um. You guys want to do some weird things? Heck yeah. Weird Let's things. Let's get weird. Baby. Feeling way too Norman. Oh. No, no, Norman. 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 Too Norman. 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 Norman Bates. Well. Paging Doctor Fraud. <laughs> it's, it's like it's like every every dad that's a serial killer. It's like a uh, uh, congratulations, your son. What do you want to name him? Normal. Uh, Norman. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> May he be better than me. Normal's a great first name. <laughs> Reg like <laughs> regular R E G L E A R. <laughs> Just a guy. Just has a first name. Regular man. <laughs> M A N N. Regular, Hugh regular man. man, young. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My favorite is oh, the uh, apocryphal story of the Nosmo King. No, I don't know that. Familiar. The name Nosmo King. Mm -hmm. The idea is that the parents were like trying <sighs> to figure out what to name the child, and uh, yeah, and it's no smoking. It was the only so. English. That's the, uh, the the reverse of that joke is uh, uh, occupado, occupado. It's the only word he knows in Spanish or whatever. <laughs> What? Okay. Uh, oh, I, I think both of them are references to being conceived in a lavatory. Oh, oh at thirty thousand feet. Ah, uh, I see. I see. <laughs> ah. Okay. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna count you in, Andrew, for weird things here. In three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Justin Robert Young. Hello. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hello. I try to get up there. But oh, man. I try it's to good. It's good. Uh, hello. That's too much. <laughs> so a couple things I want to talk about. I want to revisit a story in a little bit. But uh, this week, we are going to maybe possibly see an attempt of launching the next Starship. That's the, uh, the prototype for the new SpaceX fully reusable spacecraft. We saw the uh, SN8 go up and land really hard. I mean, I, I, land, I mean, yeah, land, land, land with panache. But better yeah. than expected. I mean, oh, right yeah. up until oh. 10 seconds beforehand, <laughs> landed much better than, than expected. Yeah, it, it had me at belly flop maneuver. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it was basically like somebody successfully doing an off-road race and then you know just uh, for style points jackknifing their car uh of uh, that as but it still rolls over the finish line like like they got everything they needed it was just you know a total demolition of the of the vehicle i i like your analogy i'm gonna one up you here i've been watching the documentary being evil and watching all those evil can evil jumps where he oh. makes the jump and yeah. then just <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, he went over. He made it over the Caesar's Palace, you know, fountains. The landing, and that's what that's what counts. Yeah, yeah. 
So, uh, yeah, but uh, there's a SpaceX uploaded a new video of it. One of the coolest parts of it is where they have the camera on the ground when you see that thing coming in down at it. And it just looks like looks like a CG render. Uh, So they're going to try SN9, which is the next starship, and that's scheduled to be uh, they're trying to figure out like launch conditions, et cetera, when they're going to launch that. And SN9, uh, you know, slightly improved. You know, I think they might be going for a higher altitude on that or maybe nail the landing. And things are moving fast. You know, we were just a few weeks ago watching SN8, and now we're already with SN9 and SN10 and 11. And so are do, being constructed. Do you think there's a psychological effect that will, um, uh, how, how can I put this? Uh, like, uh, there was some amount of time between the first time that that you know a first stage rocket landed or or number of of you know test flights up to uh, the ISS or whatever before we put human cargo in any of the the uh, sorry dra- dragon dragon capsules mm-hmm. um and then uh, uh, uh it seems like we're on track even if this iterates faster do you think that psychologically humans can get comfortable with the idea of of hopping in one of these faster or or do you think that that we're gonna have to keep on using it for for you know non-manned missions for for a hot minute i think that we're gonna want to see a lot of successful landings yeah the the advantage of here if you think about this what's kind of cool is because it's fully reusable and your costs your launch costs are so low considering is that we only got we had we we tested the space shuttle, you know, gliding off of a you know airplane landing once. We never had a fully automated space shuttle test. We've wow. never had a lot of these things tested without people. We could do hundreds of tests with Starship, hundreds of tests with Starship before any humans ever get on board it. Well, and and especially once we cross the threshold into successful reusability, right? At that point, oh boy, it really does look like CG. It looks like sci-fi, yeah. a, 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 a Starship NATO is, is what it looks like. <laughs> um, but uh, once we get to reusability, then all of a sudden we're just looking at uh, time of humans to watch and and fuel, you know, refueling costs. I guess refurbishment uh, is going to be a significant. Well, I just. But it's it's the idea is they want to they want these to be like airplanes. The idea yeah. is they come down on the ground, yeah. they do an inspection. They're now launching Falcon Nine first stages. They're getting up to like ten launches or something. Or like the the reusability window on those things is pretty amazing. And and now they say their customers prefer the used ones. Yeah, because they, because they've improved. As a matter of fact, uh, we've talked about our friend uh, Richard Garriott was talking about how he was kind of relieved. To find out he was going to be on a Soyuz capsule because they have a failure rate of zero. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, of all the times they counted it, like uh, compared to the space no, shuttle. No, Soyuz they've they've had they've had uh, two cosmonauts died when it depressurized. First head of it it crashed. That maybe the two point but they've had several uh, fatalities. Uh, I, I I know that 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 Richard was happy that he was in a Soyuz. He felt very, very, he felt safer it's, in that than in the shuttle. It's got an incredible success rate, absolutely yeah. incredible success rate, but they, and, and you could say that like in the, the, the way in, in the, you know, uh, the yeah, number of people put up there, it's super dependable. It's like a truck. Yeah. It's much safer than the shuttle. Absolutely much safer than the shuttle, but yeah, they had a depressurization event the first time they did it and whatnot. It's not perfect, but <laughs> you know, um, and, Course, that was yeah. that was one of the craziest parts. Uh, I don't know if we talked about it on this show, but uh, but while I was sick with the COVID, I watched that uh, final flight about um, the Challenger disaster. And, you know, uh, decades after that terrible event, uh, there are different interpretations. But one of them, uh, the 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 go, no go flight ops guy, whoever the money man was that, that said, yes, acceptable risk. And here he is decades after the event. And, and he's looking well aware of what kind of documentary this is. And he says straight to camera, um, yeah, going to space is extremely, extremely dangerous. And everybody who goes is a legend and a hero, and people are going to die when they do it. And that is, that is what all of us are signing up for. And it's like, wow, in an, like in an era where anybody could 
see the light or, or decide to publicly see the light over things to have, you know, hope this isn't too controversial a take, but to have the courage to say, yeah, no, it's dangerous. Going to space, dangerous. People die. I, you know, I can't speak for him. I'd say the problem there was if, if you found out, if you have a disaster and then you find out like, you know, your high level, the highest level engineers that said, there's a problem, there's a problem, there's a problem. And the person who made the decision had consistently ignored them. It's a different situation. It's not like, hey, it's Dan. And that was, that was a problem challenge. Sure. Well, and, was- and, and I am not here to, this will not be the hill I die upon, will be to defend the Challenger launch. But I found it super remarkable when this dude had every off ramp, but, inst- but instead, you know, whether it's out of stubbornness is sticking, you know, digging in his heels or whether it's, you know, truly a belief like uh, if it wasn't this, it would be something else. It's inherently risky. I, but but all I know is this guy has learned real fast that that I would never say anything like that on camera, <laughs> knowing that it was going in an adversarial documentary. <laughs> yeah, fair point. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, there is the there. There is no way you go to space without accepting a certain amount of risk. It just. And I think the big thing is like you just gotta have a process where you decide are we are we well within what we think is acceptable or are the things are things working the way they think they were you know and that's the you know putting those checks and balances in there and we watched with Boeing you know we watched systems where like literally well we can have this more advanced flight system but we'll make that an upgrade <laughs> and it's like so it's basically less safe no don't use that term that's not what that means like right. Um, it kind of sounds a, a lot like it it's is. a redundancy option. Who wants a redundancy yeah. option, sir? That's a parachute. Eh, we like to call it a redundancy option. Do you have two hundred dollars on you? So uh, it is worth mentioning, and I don't know what the current status is right now, but we used to joke about how both Elon Musk and the richest man in the world are dedicated towards spending their future fortunes on getting us into space. Now, at least for the last few days, that's the same person. Elon Musk yeah. became the richest man in the world. <laughs> yeah. Boy, that's nutty. Uh that that that's nutty especially because it's sort of an ongoing position um uh, if if anybody's been watching, you know, Tesla's meteoric rise, uh I, I guess what the author of the big short is, you know, loudly mm-hmm. shouting that he's shorting it even harder the the higher it goes and uh uh, I don't, it's it's a, a meanwhile popcorn gif you know me on the side just munching popcorn watching this yeah it's not the yeah the 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 guy that the one who uh not the author but yeah the guy with the big short was about and you know he's he's a very interesting you know uh, investor and in what he looks for and, and stuff like this and it's uh you know it's one i'm kind of the opinion like gotta gotta look at all the data points gotta look gotta look everywhere i would say that in the housing bubble, it was a kind of a thing where you could say, like, uh, you know, overvalued assets, no ability to pay for them, et cetera, or stock market, you know, valuation of a company like this. It's harder to sort of say because it's like a lot of companies, the outsized valuations stay that way forever, Amazon, et cetera. And, and so it's, it's, to me, it's like, it's a different animal. He might be right, but I'm saying it's a different thing than what he did before. So uh, and it is, it is worth nodding towards the fact that stock market is a weird animal in that uh, the quote unquote fundamentals are sort of irrelevant. What you're really betting is whether or not more and more people are going to bet on a thing. You know, it's like you're, you're factoring in future opinion on how something is going ba- instead of what the hard assets are. Well, I mean, it, well, I would, I, would, I would just say it depends on your approach. So when I was young and I wanted to get in investing, I, you know, I, Warren Buffett was, you know, what read Warren Buffett, and then he always advised Benjamin Graham's intelligent investor, which was bear, very much get into the assets of it, but because it's long term investing. I never wanted to be a day trader. I never wanted to trade every day because, like, that's gambling. I'm not a gambler. So I said, okay, I'll invest in a company that I expect to hold like 10 years from now. And that was my attitude. Like, like, how do I, will I use this product 10 years from now? So my strategy is always like, where do I think they'll be in 10 years? And not can I flip it tomorrow or next week? And so that served me really well. That served me remarkably well. Every time I looked at a company and I said, okay, well, I do I see myself using their product in 10 years? 2001, bought a lot of Apple, you know, but you know, Pixar movies. I bought Pixar. I mean, my my picks have been were always based on, oh, I like this and I think I'll keep buying it. And Tesla had its IPO. I got it involved in Tesla. And 
it's not foolproof, but it is planning for that longer term and thinking, I think they're going to have a big value in the future. Like, I'm probably going to be using Amazon products 10 years from now, probably going to be using Google and Microsoft products 10 years from now. Yeah. Those are not pot stock picks, but I'm just telling. Like, yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, like I, I get yeah, it. Trying to pick it day to day. Yeah. You're bet. Like you said, you're betting on like, what do people do? What do people do? Like I watched this go up and I'm like, oh, I'm sure it's going to fall from where that's high that it hit, but I, I'm not going to sell and try to time or try to do that. Cause I'll just go nuts. Well, and, and yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. We could talk about investing advice some other time, but, uh, but, but, but man, uh, it, it really has been remarkable to see that, uh, that, that rocket stock go nuts. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> hopefully it keeps its value, <laughs> you know, hopefully, yeah. it, you know, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think I like the product. That's the thing. And that was a that's blessing. I'll say I invested in Tesla when they did the IPO because the Model S was rated the best car of the year. Yeah. And I'm like, I, well, bet on the I believe the highest rating of or at least tied for the highest rating of all time on Consumer Reports. They later figured out something to nitpick on and, and dinged it mm. down a little bit. But but, you know, <laughs> overall, boy, oh, boy, do people who own Teslas seem to dig owning Teslas. Yeah, and I'd say, and just again, sorry for the side jack, but I'd say that's one of the things people say, oh, what about this other like a car company, whatever, like, great, what's their product? Are they making and shipping a thing that people love? Everybody can have an idea. Everybody can have a theory or a mock-up or a prototype or any business and say this, have you used it and do you love it? And that's why I, I avoid speculative market. Like I don't, somebody's going to build this. That's hard. It's really, really hard to do that. So, yeah. Well, here's some investment advice. Invest in your favorite podcasts, including this one. Patreon.com slash weird things is where you need to go to make sure that you keep this podcast a rolling. Go ahead and get your custom RSS feed. Get your uh, After Things podcast delivered to you faster than it would be otherwise. Patreon.com slash weird things. Gentlemen. Yep. The story we talked about before, but now I want to do some scenarios. BLC one, uh, uh, huh? I remember talking about BLC one, but for those of us who, you know, who are listening, who don't remember, <laughs> yeah, don't, I don't, I, don't, I mean, we all obviously photographic memory on BLC one. I mean, I but... remember the four of us were were in Cancun and we raised a toast to old B dog as we used to call <laughs> I... it. I I remember the four of us. Uh, we had all like at a football game had had written B L C and one on our stomachs and took our shirts off and were chanting B L C one. And I remember wh when you scored that field goal that won it for the home team. You said yo, and you kissed your fingers. You put them up. You put one finger in the air. And you said this is for you B L C. And then you scored yeah. the field goal. So, but some people might have missed some of that. Well, for those dummies. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, BLC1, that was the that signal that was observed around, apparently around Proxima Centauri. So we oh, have the- Oh, uh, uh, the one that for a hot second felt like, uh, like, like it had to be artificial because it was such a narrow band signal, right? And we still don't know. And it was, they were, the, the research organization that's investigating this wanted to keep a lid on it because they didn't want to come out there and like, hey, we found something. And people like, no, it's the microwave. I'm like, oh, we look dumb. We don't want that. Huh? So to their credit, they kept a lid on it, but like Guardian had a post leaked on it and they kind of provided some background details say, hey, you know, yes, we have a thing, 99.9% .9 chance it's just, some fluke it's not a thing and so they're very i think they've been a very perfectly cautious and i think they've been frustrated by the media attention to it i on the other hand think <clears throat> there's nothing wrong with saying hey yeah no it's something we're going to figure out what it is there is something because i love the process i love watching the process at work and i think that's kind of cool like hey here's a weird signal we found chances are it's something terrestrial well let's try to narrow it down so it's still, it's very interesting because uh, other people looking at the data have been like tried to look at like what could cause it. And one possibility would be like satellites and really crazy out there orbits, which could be military, secret government stuff. And some of the people that do satellite tracking, are like we ain't got nothing out there. So the source of the signal yet to be determined. So, so. I think, I think 
uh, I think we talked about this on a week that you were out of town or unavailable. Yes, yes. And, I'm um, resurfacing it for it to get to a point, but yeah. The, uh, well, well, and, and I think my proposal, and I would love to hear whether or not you think there's any merit to this, is, is there's a tendency for us to look at what we have, and what we have is a very narrow band signal. Um, but but uh, I would like to think that maybe this is a magician's point of view or whatever, but what we don't think about is, okay, let's not think of things that would cause a narrowband signal, which would be, you know, an alien civilization, that kind of thing, or a satellite. Uh, but But is it possible to think of things that absorb everything except for that narrowband signal? Like, is it possible for there to be... Uh, I, I don't know, a cloud of, of something, for example, you know, mass spectrometers or whatever, you know, get, 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 get altered when light waves go through clouds of other things or whatever. Is it possible that something natural is just filtering out everything except for this or, or, or does it sound definitely modulated to, to the best of your understanding? I mean, it would be, it would, it, it's like pointing towards a point in the sky and seeing apparently seeing like a super super broad red light that's brighter than anything else and then saying okay maybe it's a source of white light that's being filtered or something it would it would well, be a well, harder... yeah we, we, actually that's a pretty good analogy for what i'm thinking of because i could imagine you know whether it's a, a cloud of debris or something uh, that, that 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 would scatter things and maybe you know or or you know a red shift you know that's how we learned about red shifting and blue shifting galaxies and all that stuff so I, I uh, that that I get that's almost exactly my speculation. Yeah, but I'm saying it's in the thing that's the source behind it would have to be so much more energetic than anything we could conceive of. Oh, got it. So so however however powerful the signal, if that means you have to orders of magnitude amplify the signal, if we're going to put a filter between the two and we're only seeing that one part. I'd be my guy. I don't you know I don't. I'm I'm way out of my expertise here, so I would as you know, in reading as much as I have Omni magazine when I was a lad. Um, uh, it it seems to me like yeah, there. But the, that is, but to your point though, that is the the alternate explanation is something we haven't encountered before that it could be. You know, that's how we discovered you know magnetars and other stuff was we just observed this weird behavior in like you know pulsar. You're like boom, 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 boom. Like what could cause that? Right. Well, we, 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 we also talked about the weird um, uh, hexagonal rocks, the crystals. You know, it's it's. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, th I think that's where we ended up in our discussion was thinking. You know, almost certainly natural, just a type of natural yeah. thing that is new to us. Yeah, and that's what they're, and that's to the credit. That's what the researchers here at the Breakthrough Listener are trying to like. We, it, it's either it's either something coming from here, or it's probably some natural thing we never encountered before. But let's assume yes. it's not. Let's play a game. Uh, I call this game contact, arrival, or something else. <laughs> so uh, let's say you're some researchers at Breakthrough Listen, and you're handling the signal, and you go back. And uh, one of the ways, you know, uh, you know, the one of the things, they, the movie Contact's great because you see a lot of the procedure, what they do. Like you have the telescope aimed at something. You go off alignment to see if you're still picking it up, then back in alignment, et cetera. Um, Let's say you got a signal and all of a sudden you unpack it and it's a ton of data, ton of data. It's structured data. Um, okay. Okay. So in that situation, and, and by the way, that whole like moving to the left and to the right thing, am, am I right in remembering that's how the researchers discovered the background radiation from the Big Bang? Was that they're all like, well, go to the left, still there. Go to the right, still there. Wait, is there literally any direction we could point <laughs> A receiver and not get this uh and then that's that's how we how we got the background radiation in the universe i don't i don't know if that was a moving telescope or not uh oh I, I, labs, I thought I it was but but i'm you know again i, I may be misremembering yeah. it uh but man how do you even parse that proxima centauri is what a couple a couple of light years away like three and a half light years or so so long enough that a conversation uh i think we talked about this one of my favorite classes I took at UT was a thin, thinly described uh, or a thinly disguised introduction to linguistics class called Languages of Science Fiction. And um, they went through all of the cop outs that we see in, in science fiction. Uh, and absent those, what are the ways to truly establish? Like if you just have a bunch of alien chatter recorded, 
there's really, unless there's some kind of Rosetta Stone, unless there's some kind of universal constants or some kind of uh, breakdown of, of like, we know they're saying these things in their language, uh, then there's really no way to figure it out short of uh, a, a back and forth conversation. So unless they're broadcasting a, a, a primer, I, I don't know. Well, this... I don't know how we would, this would find out what, what it is. Well, th this would be an intentional signal. This would be clearly aimed at us. This is not us picking up. This would, it, I mean, so so almost likely, almost certain they almost certainly they would include some kind of key. Yeah, because like you know people like there's people point out ah oh, well this proximatari is too young to support life. Well, if you're dealing with the interstellar civilization and you want to be polite, uh, maybe the polite thing is to go to the next star system over and put a transmitter and say, hey, if you get this, we're here. We, we don't want to come into your solar system or evade you or whatever. We're using this sort of frequency, which is a pretty good frequency. Um, and so I would say that it would be it'd be most likely if it's aimed at Earth, it's something intentionally aimed at Earth. So we're assuming they're trying to contact. Let's assume that it's real and they're trying to contact. And, and the scenarios could be, uh, you know, in what would you send? You know, you could send in... You could send like the Encyclopedia Galactica. You could send the uh, in contact. Hey, here's a machine to come visit us. Um, mm -hmm. You could do arrival. Here's this special language to let you look at the world in entirely different kind of ways of seeing things, which I loved arrival. Thought it was great. Um, you have the species thing. Hey, here's some DNA. Grow this. See what happens. Wink, wink. Um, another <laughs> option would be an AI. Imagine being able to send sort of a simple AI that can answer your questions. Uh, that makes maybe the most sense because maybe the, uh, the AI could even, uh, if it was, I don't know, figure another, what, 150, 300 years from now, AIs will be smart enough to just, you know, set them up, say, just listen. Once you detect this threshold of, you know, what appears to be, you know, learn their language, learn all that stuff, just, just, listen and then at some point say hey how's it going not going to say who we are or where we're from but are you cool because we're cool and then uh, and it seems like an ai could have that wink wink conversation right so and also it would just be kind of like the the, the set it and forget it uh a uh, part of of building an interstellar coalition right you would just have your century there to be like all right well let's see at, at the point that we reach any level of compatibility and then we'll just uh, reach out. Hey, congratulations. Uh, uh, you now have a technology sophisticated enough to talk with us. Uh, but would, would you like to know who we are? Why yeah. or N? Well, and, and plus also, I think that there's an inherent bias. You know, you think of the Independence Day problem, like it's our resources. They want to come and steal our valuable rocks. Spoiler alert universe is filled with rocks and if you're going to spend the energy and the technology in order to get somewhere you're probably not going to bother to come to earth you for could probably generate rocks. that you could generate that kind of value in another way that doesn't involve coming down to making us the center of the story yeah it's like or like the tv show v which was fun and some other ones they're here to steal our water what europa wasn't good enough like all these other places just filled with water just weren't good enough like you had to come here to steal our water yeah you know what's funny is i want to hold back like a 40 year old spoiler and say like but they also needed food in the form of humans <laughs> what yeah ah! uh so because i think that's obviously if we got like oh it's code nobody nobody in the rooms be like well let's run this thing everybody's gonna be like Ooh, what do we do here what should we run this code and it could be like GoDaddy's horrific like phishing thing they did to people for the holidays. Like what you was suckers that? clicked on the uh apparently um they sent an email out to people saying, Congratulations, you've got a Christmas bonus, you know, for your hard work. Click here. You clicked on it, and then a while yeah. later you got a notice like, hey, uh, that was a phishing scam that we tested you on and you failed it. Uh, and, so and of this, course, this is, uh, there, there's, there, there's a great episode of Darknet Diaries that goes into, uh, cause they talk to a lot of white hat hackers that, uh, deal with, uh, you know, these kinds of situations. And there really is an ethical line that they have to walk of like, all right, well, 
at, at what point are we number one doing the client a disservice by not at by not doing the the same kind of dirty schemes that somebody nefarious would pull uh but at the same time are we actively harassing the employees of the company that we are that we are now working for to prove that their employees are not being digitally safe enough yeah that boy knowing it was only sent to employees does kind of color it a bit because um i don't think it's out of bounds for a company to say we expect we expect um excellence in your informational hygiene at our company and as a result just know that we're going to look for excellence and if you're not excellent we're going to let you know and uh this could be one of those things that pops up yeah i could see that i you know to do it before the holidays and plus with a round of firings and there would be no actual bonus I'm like, uh, like, yeah, there are things I can do to find out if somebody's loyal or somebody's smart. I'm not gonna do all of them, and and it's and it led to, get, shocker, everybody hates GoDaddy more than before. <laughs> I was about to say <laughs> they they yeah. weren't in a great position to begin with, but and know, that's for and, them, that, and like, that's the thing is 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 you know for 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 the the contractors if it was GoDaddy itself and not a contractor that's a different thing, uh, but. Uh, even if it was internal, the idea of like, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that there is a line. There's a line that like, yes, a black hat hacker could take advantage of this. Uh, also, you're actively being a major peen to all of your employees. <laughs> like, like, is is that juice worth the squeeze? Yeah, that's tough too because like, uh, I know that that whenever you go to a third party contractor, I mean, you are expected to get results where it's like. Um, hey, w you want us to play softball with you or hardball? They're like, no, man, we're paying you the big bucks. You play the hardest hardball you can hardball because we're spending money to find out if you can get us. It's like, well, congrats. It's going to be a Christmas bonus phishing email. Uh, like, I, 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 I don't know. It's hard for, knowing that it probably I, there was, was a there third was also, party. There was, another, there was another story recently that was, like, even more direct as to, like, a... Uh, uh, firings or something like that like it it, it it played even more into kind of our our current economic instability Oof. that was like another well let's just make sure you don't click links no matter what they say yeah yeah so that's the problem we run into if the aliens send us some code uh, i think everybody in the room would be like no we don't want to click on this because we're probably the bad idea but uh so I don't know that I would trust an alien civilization that would send us an AI and say, no, just start it up. It's safe. It's no, it's safe. It's totally safe. I, I would imagine like in a world where, I mean, if you have the resources to set up an outpost between your civilization and ours to pay attention and then send signals, it seems like the resource, the most valuable resource would be whatever interesting research we have to bring to the table. And so in that regard, I, 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 it's it's hard. I I am inclined, and maybe maybe you can convince me otherwise. But I'm inclined to assume across the board that we're just helping a grad student out, uh, and and I can't imagine what they would get out of malicious code. Well, that's the problem. Is we can't imagine, and that is the thing is that is that we could think of things like, for instance, I think we've talked about this before. Like in Star Trek, like oh the the threshold is you develop warp drive. I think the threshold if there are aliens watching us is you develop really smart AI. Once a civilization has developed AI, that's the point at which they accelerate. They theoretically could accelerate very quickly. And if you're worried about things either combusting or gray goo or all the horrific AI scenarios, that's what you want to watch for is pay attention to like, how's this other, how's this civilization's AI progress coming? And do we want to help them or not? Or are we dealing with other AI? Is it AI that's out there that took over? And it's like, all yeah, right. That's, wetware that 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 that, that to me is the, is, is the question is whether or not and the ai is looking from beyond the stars saying like oh finally a new life shedding its larva of shell of of humanity like let's bring this into the fold welcome ai 
So uh, there could be uh, religious extremists, could be a lot of reasons, you know, just, just so many. And and thing to think about too is that we often advantage in like, oh, well, really advanced civilization, they would be so smart and wise because they have this advanced civilization. Well, I mean, the people that built it were, but, you know, what happens 10,000 years later when, you know, everybody becomes dumb and they have star drives and all this cool tech and they develop, become like a bunch of people living in, you know, Malibu with crazy religious ideas and stuff and <laughs> anti-vaccination schemes. We're, you know, we're not talking about then? any one particular set of people, just in general, <laughs> talking about alien civilizations Fine, but, on the West Malibu, Coast uh, in general. <laughs> I'm just, just saying. Um, but I say that's the thing too. It's like it's like I love that that there was that Saturday Night Live episode where the the spaceship lands and two pilgrims walk out with like muskets. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, acting like they're, uh, they're they're superior. Yeah. You know, so anyhow, I think that it's a very interesting scenario to think about. Like, what what do you do? What would you guys do if all of a sudden like you got like you got Encyclopedia Galactica and there's a lot of cool stuff in there, you know, technology, designs, inventions. This is where this is where everybody who's my friend in IT says, "Duh, what you do is you create a virtual server and just run the code in a virtual server." I don't see what the big deal is, uh, which I'm well, sure. Let's say it's a text file. Let's say it's a text file. You're not executing anything. You you so. I mean, yeah, you definitely read it, right? And and that is one of the nice things is that if it's an AI and it has been listening, which would be extraordinary given that we haven't you know aimed anything their way so if an ai was able to parse our radio signals that means it would only be like <laughs> like in the aughts uh in terms of the the lagging behind our our technology as it started to uh or our our history our story as it started to transmit um yeah i don't know i i i, I would I, I i'm already already you know i say run the code like, what do you got for us? <laughs> so I'm saying like, even like you personally, like all of a sudden you have Encyclopedia Galactica and you see things like warp drives and stuff in there. Ooh, oh, that's interesting. So like an infection in terms of uh, like fire stolen from the gods, where all of a sudden we're advancing, quote unquote, beyond what our civilization should be or whatever, which I um, think is an inherently I, awful position. Um, imagine... Imagine we brought, remember kids Encyclopedia Britannica when the internet was on printed paper? Imagine you brought a 2020 edition, I'm sure it exists somewhere, to 1,020, 1,000 years ago. Yeah, they what didn't do you, read I, it. I, uh, I, I, I think about that oftentimes... <laughs> Way too often when I, when I, when I, when I fantasize about like, you know, if I were to just wake up and it was 500 years ago, a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago or whatever, biggest problem I'd have would be the fact that even if it was English, any version of English, I wouldn't be able to understand other people. They wouldn't be able to understand me. But once we got past that, uh, I think to myself, like, what are the gifts that would be most valuable to them uh in terms of fundamental understanding of the universe um i don't really have i would say germ theory would be a big one but but i don't know how i could get them to believe me um uh, gravity of course eventually became very important but but all but but a huge chunk of that was the invention of calculus so that you could accurately describe gravity i i, I don't know what, uh, what about you justin uh uh uh, out, um, in addition to, of course, the 19 or, or 2015 sports almanac. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, re restate the question. There's, there's some stuff that's happening on, on Twitter right now that I, I have had to uh, juggle. So I've been if, in and out here. If you were to teleport back into the past and, and knowing the fundamental technologies that, you know, in the 21st century, and you're going, let's say 500, a thousand years, 2000 years or whatever, which of the, the things that are common knowledge now that you have do you think would be the most important gift for you to bring? Oh, man. Um, I guess my, my, my initial thought would be, you know, some level of, of, of automation or computation. Uh, but I don't know whether or not, I mean, that's certainly not a skill that I particularly have in my head, right? I mean, if I could have it and go back, 
then then obviously that would be uh uh the 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 ideal thing to do but uh i don't know i i guess that 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 that'd be that'd be my initial thought i think you know if you have the encyclopedia there you could go through stuff that we kind of forget's useful but like start with you know, let's say we're some monk in a monastery or whatever, and we've come across this knowledge. What's going to be the most useful? You know, pasteurization is going to be useful. You know, that there's yeah. an immediate application towards that. You might then look at uh, things on, you know, what what is your role? Your your role is food. So that what what applies to agriculture, like fertilization techniques, like how do you make your fields a little bit more, you know, abundant? Uh, how do you do? improve things candle making it's, you just start with the low level stuff then work your way up to like you know metal working and how to make how to make steel yeah you know what um, would be which, wild is if you could let's say you're able to talk and build a reputation uh, i would say that your real gifts would come like five or ten years in once you have a reputation of like we don't know how or why and this guy's clearly crazy talking about you know metal beasts flying in the sky and living in amazing you know millions of people in a city uh, but we've we've now hit a point where we believe whatever they say, and so as a result, you could start proclaiming things that are that you know are possible, even if you don't know how to do them. For example, like um, uh, oh, uh, uh, fertilizing. We were talking about, you know, the same guy that uh, 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 that later would create a, 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 a Zyklon B or whatever that, that that was used in the Holocaust. That same guy figured out the technique to extract nitrogen from the air for uh, fertilization. So it's thought that he saved millions of millions of lives from, from famine. But like, I don't know how that works or what it is, uh, but I know it can also be used to be made, made into bombs or whatever, but like just me knowing it for a fact and having dedicated people believing it, it's sort of like that phenomenon where nobody could do a certain thing in juggling until a YouTube video pops up with it. And then like 48 hours later, three other people can do it as well. When there's, there's I, I, a lot I also of... wonder at, at, at what point does the prophesizer become the inventor, right? If you're out oh, there yeah. saying that this stuff can happen, then you're now the inventor of these things, whether or not you're the person to fully develop it. <laughs> Steve Jobs. <clears throat> Sorry, what? Well, you could... Oh, I don't. Uh, know. I oh mean, well, I mean, because well, I mean, essentially, Steve Jobs, you know, like, like, uh, 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 he knew. Well, no, no, no. He, he knew no, it he, could be he done. He made the thing. No, no, no. He, he didn't. He didn't. He was I, not I in would, the laboratory not... at four in the morning, soldering parts together himself. He went to his he team wasn't, and he said, wasn't raising "I know money you could start a company yeah, to, exactly. to launch object-oriented programming and to put more money than anybody ever else did it." Well, he did do that, but that's entirely different way of looking at it. Oh no, no. But my 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 point is is Wozniak did not invent the soldering iron, Brian. Uh, my, my, my point is if the issue is, uh, uh, that, that, uh, at what point does declaring that something is possible become indistinguishable from invention? And, uh, well, and, 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 and that's, that's the example that pops into my mind is St uh, uh, Steve Jobs was right. It was possible to combine, you know, uh, the best iPod, uh, hey, phone, not and a communication that, device. But, but this is, oh it's my weird God. He's now, not a guy Brian, that just said, now we're into this ditch. Why did it, you get us into this ditch? Yeah. I, I, like, I'm not, not like, interested in it. I, I mean, you started yeah, you are. It. It's not you like are. He, it's, it's not like he just said, oh, it'd be cool if he had to find the resources and the people and the talent. To, he had to build the machine to make the machine. I, you sorry. Know? And, uh, 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 apologies. Apparently, I misunderstood something. Uh, but 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 to the question of whether or not uh, uh, declaring something is possible is becomes indistinguishable uh, from invention. Uh, I think yes, I would agree with that. It if won't you get you very books, far. There, this you, would be this would be like a guy in PC magazine or whatever writing all of the like things that were going to happen, and then they all happened, right? And then at what point do you go from the muse that the inventors listened to? to the guy that really was the the origin point for a lot of these ideas. I think that that the actual creators still wind up getting their due, but you become this mythical, you know, shamanic figure for whom charted out the future. I would I'd say that like, I mean there's the difference between like, hey, I have an idea and then like Edison, you know, we could count the number of times that like 
the use of carbon in incandescent bulbs had been invented prior to Edison. The thing that Edison had was when Edison had been an inventor with like the multiple accelerator, he had to then he took all that money, he put it into this Menlo Park and his research lab to build things. And then he hired brilliant minds, people to solve problems for him. He built the machine to make the machines. And I guess that's kind of thing too. If you go back in time, you can say, I would not tell stories about the fantastical future because you're going to probably find yourself, you know, uh, burned alive. Yeah. What I would do is, you know, maybe you become a blacksmith like Doc Brown, whatever. And like, hey, you know, we could add a little notch at the end of this hammer so we could pull nails out. Like, yeah. hey, uh, we might have a better way to make a hammer. You know, oh, wait, let's add a little knob here so it make, gives you more pull. Like, you could just pick up a toolbox and say, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this. Nobody's going to call you, accuse you of witchcraft. They're just going to think you're a really clever person. And I think you would you would work for, like, where how could you what are the simple things that you could do that would just make things a lot better and you know, one of the best innovations that i ever heard was like uh accounting the idea of using you know the two boxes you know one for current one for ad whatever like double ledger accounting like how big of an influence that would have on systems you could go back in time go look at how a business was run and like Oh, you're using medieval numbers still. <laughs> you're using Roman numerals. Let's let's use these crazy Arabic numbers, whatever. The, there was um, something uh, I want to say maybe ten years ago, maybe fifteen. But but um, when you think of simple machines, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna mangle all of this. But it's like there there's only there, there are fewer types of simple mach- machines than you would think. You know, a piston, a lever, a blah blah blah, or whatever. Uh, and then it's like a, a, a and then a hundred years goes by. And very recently, like, a, 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 again, I'm getting all of this wrong, a seventh or eighth simple machine is discovered, uh, a fundamental simple machine. And it's like, that is definitely the kind of stuff that could be in an Encyclopedia Galactica, where it's uh, where all of a sudden it's like, well, you probably have some of these. Which ones do you not have? How can you use them? Yeah, I think that's there's some there's some kinds of innovation. We're just not going to be ready to be like, oh, we're going to show you how to build a new, you know, diamond lattice microprocessor using your you know quasar lab like great what do those things mean oh sorry wrong edition um uh we have like a twinkie that has no calories yes (laughs) all right (laughs) unfortunately that message goes to uh uh like 1500 years ago when people were starving they're all like why would anybody want a twinkie with no calories in it (laughs) So, uh, anyway, I think it's a very interesting to think about, like, what would we, what would be useful and not too destructive and forwards and backwards. I, I, I one thing we haven't mes- mentioned that I'm, I'm a bit surprised because usually it's one of the first things that comes up is a map. Isn't that usually one of the first things that you say is like, oh, hello, people of this island. Um, there is a thing called the world, and this is what it looks like. So, yeah, I mean. In terms of, of like who's where, like certainly if there's political yeah. beef and there is a, a gray goo, like, hey, as you're exploring, um, all of this land is, or all, all of this space is covered by AI bots that are self-replicating and, you know, they're, we're embarrassed of them. Please don't go over there. God, what if it's like one of those fast food maps they'd put on trays of like sponsor, businesses that sponsored it? I've, uh, yeah, the I've coupons heard. and stuff. Uh, well, well, especially knowing that there's all like, let's say, let's say there's a fundamental truth, but somebody has a patent on the left-handed molecule versus the right-handed molecule. And so they're all like, so anyway, when you do this, make sure to use the left-handed molecule because that's the only one true molecule brought to you by left-handed molecules. I can't even imagine. I, I, yeah, <laughs> that's the, the thing that I, that I think would be helpful is either, I think either it's AI or it's AI plus like a lot. Of, if it's a lot of civilizations, the night the upside of that is when you go around the world and you go to big cities, you go to you know you go to you know Singapore or you go to uh, Hong Kong or whatever. Um, they look similar. You go you go downtown near you're in middle of New York City and you're in the middle of a big city in some foreign country. There's a similarity to them. There's a familiarity that happens when so many cultures come together and sort of navigate. This is kind of how we're all going to get along. 
And so you kind of feel, you actually feel more at home in a big, I think we'd feel more at home in a big city in an alien civilization than just some rando planet. Yeah, I, I, I definitely know that's true when it comes to just a, a rural, like take all of the sub 3000 population cities on the planet and think of how wildly different one to the next might look. Everything from, you know, puritanical 1680s, you know, New England, you know, to uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa or whatever. Um, yeah, no, that would be fascinating. I think about if you were to travel back in time, you would want to go to Venice. You would probably rather go to London. You'd probably want to go to like some place that's like one on the water in a trading port or whatever, because they're going to be a lot more forgiving to somebody dressed funny and talking weird. Yeah. So you guys want to do picks? Let's do it. I got it. Yeah. Pick. What you got? So I am just back from on the road and I'm here to say that definitively the best on the road companion that I have ever had is the Oculus Quest 2. Oh, for which I got for for which I got for Christmas and I got to say it has stood up not only as a uh, a a a game with a bunch of console or a bunch of uh, or a console with a bunch of games but also uh, the fact that it uh is is pretty robust with like not great Wi-Fi like there was like a lot of stuff I was able to do with uh, and download stuff and and uh, play online multiplayer stuff like with a uh, uh, not you know perfect Wi-Fi uh, uh it's it's exceeded my expectations and i just have to say that that the utility of uh having just a slap it on take it off as casually as you as as you would pick up and put down your phone is all the difference all the difference in the world it is just uh, uh it, it changes how you think about it changes the games you want to play changes like uh, i had a i had a moment where I ordered food from a restaurant to pick up like uh, around the block from where I was staying, slapped on the Oculus Quest, played eight holes of golf, and then took it off, went over and picked up my food. And it was just that simple. And I would have never thought about VR in that way before until the Quest. So a uh, uh, big, too enthusiastic thumbs up for the Quest. Did, uh, did you rock it on the plane? On the plane ride? No. Sitting in your no. seat? Next to some lady Ryan, that you wanted I don't to know if, ignore. I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know if you're aware of the cultural moment that we're in right now, but horsing off on a plane is not something that's going to be uh, uh, taken in any way other than a, uh, a, 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 a tremendous problem, both by the, the staff of the plane and those on it. Huh. This would, is the Oculus Quest oh, 2, you say? I'm looking this up right yes, now. Yes, no one has mm. ever talked about okay. it on this show Goodness before, me. and I'm glad to bring it to... No, Brian, no, in all seriousness, on edge is how I would describe the mood oh, of, really? uh, of, of flights these days. Like, nobody is in the mood for anything other than getting... You know, if, if every flight could have a fast forward... It would be when I first got on on the first flight that connected through Houston going to Atlanta, the pilot got out to the cabin and said, uh, hey, like just gave us like a dad talk on how everyone's going to wear a mask and nobody. It doesn't matter what your political opinions are and what your thoughts are, the science are. And everyone just kind of looks at him like, OK, dude, cool. We're all wearing masks. And he just kind of like breaks down. It's like. We've had an issue, and then just walk back <laughs> into the cabin. Like so, it it is from from the the flight attendants to everybody else. Like now is not the time for anything other than falling asleep on a plane, for which I'm able to do, and that's that's what I did. But uh, I, I would even say then you you probably wouldn't want to do it unless you're just watching a movie or something. And, and even at that point, it's it's not necessarily the best. Uh, uh, for that, unless you're streaming, um, because you even when you're when you're playing with those those things, it's like you don't realize time melts, man. Like uh, there were a couple times where I was in a smaller uh, uh space in in one of the hotel rooms that I was staying at, where my 
arms were kind of hitting. If I put my barrier right up against the wall, my arms were kind of hitting the barrier. Uh, uh, it is, it is immersive, man. It is, it is something that you, um, you, you want a little bit of space, but at the same time, all you really need is a little bit of space. Yeah. I suppose that's why I would totally expect to see somebody at least try to do it on a plane, you know, specifically for that time melting capability. It's, it's, you can, but it's like, I mean, you got to do an Oculus Go on a plane, you know, but it's like here because it's the 360, the moving around, you're stuck in your seat. It's not as like, there aren't a lot of experiences of just sitting in your chair for VR, even yeah. though you, the really cool ones, there's some, but it's not even the stationary experiences are limited. Yeah. Cause you're, you're, you're looking to the side, you know, uh, and, and if, if you're worried about hitting somebody in, in the face with your, with your, uh, uh, visor, you know, I think that that would at least for me be enough not to do it. But, uh, again, it's like, if you've got a movie on there, if you're watching it like that, then maybe, but even then, you know, I think it, uh, uh, you might even want the utility of just having it on, on, on your phone. The, the, where, where time really melts is when you are in a game, you know? And, and so I played through, uh, Trover saves the universe, the Justin Roiland game, which, um, uh, is very, very Justin Roiland. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just say if you, uh, uh, if, 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 if you don't, like if you don't find charming Justin Roiland ad libbing, then uh, uh, you might want to skip it because boy, is it a lot of Justin Roiland doing those? Yeah, man, just I'm, I'm gonna ad lib. Yeah, that's what I'm Justin Roiland and I'm ad libbing right now. Don't know what I'm gonna say, but boy, am I, I'm saying it right now. Like that's uh, every character the entire time. I enjoyed it, I thought it was really fun, but I had a situation where I sat down. Uh, uh, when a football game was just starting, I finished up Trover Saves the Universe and it was three minutes left in the third quarter. And boy, did it not feel like I had taken that much time. It felt like I had just gone through like two and a half levels. Wow. Uh, I, I, man, I, I guess I'm just going to double down on, um, uh, on, on my past pick of, of uh, Kim's Convenience. Uh, we continue to be plowing through it with family. It's great. It's great. I love everything about it. it makes me feel connected to uh, all of humanity, and it, it, I, I, I love it. I, uh, I, I booted Kim's up uh, earlier this morning, and uh, there I, I had not seen that whole fourth season. I just missed that they added a, a fourth season to Netflix. Uh, but I, that show's good. Yeah, that's way good. good. Uh, I got a pick. Uh, I've been using this for... Uh, a little project after uh, someone on the show recommended. I wonder who. Uh, I would like to re re recommend Notion. Uh, hey, the uh, kind of document processing suite. Um, I I have found I'm still getting used to it. I'm still figuring it out. I'm still figuring out what the most effective uses of it is. Um, right now I'm using it for a lot of word processing. Um, for organizing pages and sub pages, um, it's got a little calendar view, which is very helpful. Part of the thing that I'm working on needs um needs a little bit of a schedule, and um and, and it's it's cool. I I was able to get a lot of it done just on my iPad uh, uh, last night, and I think I think that's a, it's a it's really cool the way that it makes stuff like databases um, easy to make and to uh, to organize. In fact, my only my only the only thing I bumped into as a uh, productivity problem with Notion is that you can't you can't make a table that isn't a database. So when you make a database, you get this whole big view with uh, different views and properties and filters. And, and I just wanted to make a little two column, just a little boop and boop. Um, and there's they don't have they still don't have that yet. Uh, but I, I think it's I think it's 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 really uh, it's it's really cool. I think you know this thing I'm doing like could have been like a Google Doc or then maybe a Google Sheet for some of it. But looking at all the things that Notion can do, uh, it it seems like it's going to be a kind of a one one a one size fits all solution for the or a one stop shop more and more one stop shop. Um, so, uh, <laughs> one size available <laughs> <laughs> and uh and also it's free like i think they have you can pay for some stuff but like just using it for personal 
use uh, is free and you get all of the stuff with it. And it's even even like little stuff, like you can put little icons for your different pages and uh, you can make like a little banner image and they have like an image library that you can just search and just put stuff in there and it's that doesn't cost you anything extra. It's, it's, it's really cool notion. It's a, such an interesting paradigm for doing stuff. And, and I found, I haven't used it lately because part of it I kind of run into sort of like, I wish I could do this with it. And then I don't, but it is really, really for self journaling and keeping track of stuff and tasks. It's super powerful. I, uh, I, I read an article, maybe it was on Buzzfeed news the past week, but apparently the, a hot new TikTok craze has been to get, uh, get the audience of TikTok, which is often younger into making a notion and you make, make here, go to a notion and you can make your daily, your daily tasks and don't forget to take your pills and here's your calendar and here's your, you can journal stuff here. You can keep track of all the movies and TV that you want to watch or have watched. And, and it really, it really can support all that stuff. It's, 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 uh, it's interesting I, seeing that as a it, meme. Yeah. I think it's just such a, it's such a great tool and it, Every time I use it, I'm just like, man, why, how much did Google fumble the bag? Like, cause like so <laughs> much of what, so much of what I use it for is just like, oh, this is what docs should be. Oh, this is what uh, sheets should be. This is where things should have evolved. It really is such those products, which are indispensable, right? I still use docs. I still use sheets, but they're, they're they basically killed Microsoft's office suite and then declared victory. And that was it. <laughs> yeah. Like, and they, they're like, well, we did it. We hit we the did end it. of the internet. We, we defeated the year 2000 and now have made it to the year 2001. Woo! That's good enough. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's crazy. Yeah. No it is. Yeah. It's Google Docs is interesting to you because like, do you know what file format a Google Doc it, document is? Uh, man, I, I don't even know. Like, I know that it'll download it in whatever, you know, in a whatever Doc, format is it, you want. Is it, is it Doc Doc X, X or, or something? That, or a PDF a, or... Trick question, there is none. Yeah, there is none. There is none. Yeah. 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 It's, it's just, it's just, it's a file. They have no file. No, there is no format. It is, that's, that's like their idea of like, just the data guys. So they're, they, they like Larry Page had such a granular idea about what he wanted the data to be. But he never stopped to think about, you know, the, the structure of itself. But yeah, I think that's notions exciting because it's like, man, let's revisit all these things we thought were solved problems and now create things that are really cool. And I think that or something, I think we're going to get blogging back in some form. I think we probably get some things that we kind of let go and now maybe go like, oh, it'd be cool to have a thing on the web that's not just my hot takes about the pancakes I ate. <laughs> I, uh, I uh, took a trip um, Saturday. Um, I went to Indiana and a little town there called Hawkins. Uh, they had an opening of the star court mall, which I went to go watch that, which was pretty cool. And, uh, you know, a little chaos there. There was a little bit of a power outrage and some teenagers around there, like some troubled kids there, but all in all, it was a pleasant trip. So I'm, I'm in an alternate timeline would still be trying to figure out what you're talking about. But in this timeline, I've seen that Bryce has already pulled up the strange things drive into experience. So <laughs> we, we, we talked about this, uh, as, as a, as a concept, but you did it. Yeah, did it, did it, went and did it Saturday. So what it is, is in downtown LA, you buy your tickets, you pull up in your car and they have a stranger things. It's basically a haunted house for your car. Uh, you get to go too. Um, and <laughs> you show up at an allotted time. And they feed you into first into a parking lot where you line up on a parking lot and they have up on a stage, they have the, whatever the science, a guy playing the role of the science teacher, the video screen. He's there to MC the opening of star court mall. And then they have actors dressed as the kids from stranger things, which is incredibly convincing when everybody wears a face mask running around with some video equipment, like doing their AV club stuff and reenacting scenes from the movie with like, you know, the fight over, you know, who, you know, uh, taking L for granted, whatever. And uh, so you get scenes reenacted by actors there going through there. Then there's power outages. You listen to the whole thing on your radio in your car. If you want food, you can actually just scan a QR code and order popcorn or whatever. They bring it to your window where you get the first part of there. Then, you know, it's like a half an hour. And then finally the cars go up into a parking garage 
and you wind through the parking garage and if you go into the parking garage all of a sudden it goes from star court to some secret russian facility with the russians walking around and your cars are lined up and then you watch kind of actors enact another kind of a sequence or show for you with russians running around and demogorgons playing around in their windows and stuff and blackouts and stuff then you go to another level, you go through this sort of weird sort of thing where like what I'm seeing right now, where you see the vines have taken over and you turn out all the car lights. So all the cars in the parking garage are there with the lights out and there's this weird VFX light show and stuff that plays. Then you finally make your way to the roof where they have a big, huge sort of setup there where they do uh, multiple actors playing the parts, video displays, incredible, big, big sort of production. So it was cool. That's I mean, awesome. It was like... Yeah, I mean, it, it. by no means was I like, oh, this was amazing and perfect. But there's not a lot of practice making car drive-through attraction experiences. And what they're able to pull off was pretty amazing. Well, and, and especially, I totally assumed this would be like a, a car wash thing where you would drive up and it would hook up and just tow your car around. But it sounds like oh, you're God. being directed and you're actually driving, driving on purpose from point A to point B. Yeah, there are hundreds of cars here. I don't know. I mean, That's it's crazy. Not, they're not going to build, you know, a car tow thing. Like, yeah, no, it's, it's, you know, you drive, you're driving through a parking garage. First, you're like, oh my God, I, well, we drive through parking garages all the time. They've solved the liability of that. Uh, and here, you know, the people directing you to stop, move forward, where to go. There's even, uh, even a gift shop. You pull your car up into a place, scan a QR code, and they'll bring whatever you wanted to buy up to you. And so it's put on by Fever, which does other kind of attractions. So it is a, very and again it's not like you're brought and they explain like you're in one stage then they say okay everybody go to stage two and they'll call it stage two and they bring you there and your car stop and you do that and then you go to the next stage and your car stops so the attractions are basically when your car stopped you're not like moving you're moving through like everything's designed and stuff but the, the main part of the attractions when your cars are parked and scenes happen in front of you that's awesome but, uh, how expensive think, yeah, was just, it just 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 a great idea yeah i'm curious there yeah, it was uh, thirty bucks per person, and um, so how you, long? Like, are, oh, we were there like an hour and a half, and That's and cool. I would say that like uh, like we've done like their Christmas lights, car, car drive throughs things. There's stuff like that before. This was a whole different level than anything I've ever experienced like that. This was a literally like dozens and dozens of actors playing out scenes. It was kind of as close to like a theme park show as you could get where you turn like, you know, a parking garage into this. So um, I think that's I mean, a it was great it. idea. Yeah. Yeah. And I would I would love to see more stuff like that. That's kind of on the level of somewhere between like a Halloween Horror Nights haunted house and like a stunt spectacular, you know, without some of the the, 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 the jumping and diving and stuff like that. Unless there was, which is great. Uh, I, I think it's it, it it shows a lot of ingenuity. Uh, uh, and I think people are starved for it right now because, yeah. you know, pe people don't go to theme parks, you know, because they don't like these kinds of things. And to to, to microize it and, and sell it for thirty dollars is a great idea. Yeah, sixty dollars per two person car, then add a person for thirty. So like, I we were we had fun. I mean, again, I could nitpick it to hell, but like, point was like what they pulled off. It's not like a haunted house where you can draw upon thousands of haunted houses and say, yeah, and we'll use this here and we'll do this here. It worked worked great was really impressed that's awesome yep. gentlemen it's been weird i gotta run oh okay see ya sorry see you around uh that's fine we've got a we got an email we can do here and uh we'll nice keep, we'll keep it a little quick because you know you guys got you yeah guys i think yeah because we only got yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah we're doing happy hour right yeah otherwise yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I, I have. I have. Yeah. Let, let, let's let, let's let's roll right into it because ready. I still got to cook food. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I think. Sorry. By the way, I'm getting texts about how Donald uh, Trump resigned <laughs> and like. So oh wait, I is that a thing? Like, no, it was a it hoax. Was, was, I see. From it's someone a, at the it's department. It's a thing on oh. Twitter, but I have people e texting me about it, and I'm then so I, I disconnected because I didn't know whether or not I needed to to drop sure, off sure, the sure. show and no worries cover that. There we go. That's what I look for. All right. Yeah, let's do, we'll just jump right into after things. How about that? All yep. right. Here we go. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the After Things Podcast. I'm your host, Bryce Castillo, today. Joined, as always, with Justin Robert Young. 
Hello. And Brian Brushwood. Ahoy, ahoy. We got an email here from uh, 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 an After Things listener, Reticent, who writes, uh, Greetings, After Things crew, longtime listener of the Diamond Club universe. Thanks for all the shows that you make. I have a podcast of my own and would normally plug it, but you'll see why not from my question. My question is, my podcast has attracted someone who made a subreddit about the show. It's a dream come true for a small podcast, but that turned into a nightmare as they really only did it to complain about the show and not in a constructive way. What should we do about this? We currently have a do not feed the troll policy about it, but if you search for us on Reddit, it's the thing that comes up and it makes us look bad. What do you think we should do about this? Um, Handling trolls online. Man, uh, I I know that uh, different organizations uh, either have a heavy hand or a light touch when it comes to these type of things. Uh, if, If you're building an online culture, usually they're there because they want to support you in which case you can say hey all things being equal this is how we want to go about it for example you know there the, the, there is sort of a a nucleation point where you need um kind of a critical mass of, of of a gathering place of people and so there's one property some friends of mine were like uh hey can we hold off on doing the reddit thing we just want everybody to go to facebook groups for a little bit and then we'll mm-hmm. figure out where we go from there and then sure enough once they hit critical mass they were able to launch a separate reddit thing and they were able to establish policies and, and structures and all that stuff uh, however that works less well if you're doing anything controversial so let's let's say uh, for all we know they're complaining about the quality of the podcast but let's say they were uh, complaining about the politics of the podcast, right? Let's say, let's say it was a red team, blue team thing, or a green team, yellow team, uh, and um, okay. there's some amount of adversarial content that is to be expected, but it's up to you to sort of draw a bigger circle around that circle. So if there's any legitimacy to their grievances, then say, um, I, I, hopefully, you have enough sway with your audience that you could. Uh, draw uh, it, it actively say, Hey, man, there's this one guy doing this one thing, we don't like it. We're gonna have everybody go to this bigger, cooler official clubhouse. I mean, we see this in video games all the time there's an official channel and an unofficial channel for everything, mm-hmm. or, or even broader, especially on Reddit, right? You know, r slash gaming versus r slash real gaming, or you know, uh, ga- good game or whatever, you know, like, like the popularity of something often uh, uh, means that there are methods to methods and reasoning to have uh, offshoots or specifically uh, arranged things. So it, it, it could even be a funny bit to be like, if their thing is like r slash your podcast name, it would be, you could do like r slash good your podcast name, or I don't know what, so, like to, to almost subvert that a little bit. Um, because I think certainly tell me if this seems off but like trying to go i don't know head to head against this thing and get it taken down or have any well, sort never, of administrative yeah, I mean, thing right, impossible, yeah, no, impossible never, never 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 do at that best. yeah all right uh uh front of the store advice focus on your product if you got a small show focus on your product make your product better continue to evolve the podcast uh uh, uh try to not only block out the noise, but also make sure that you are listening to enough of your audience to understand where improvement can happen and continue to think about how you can make it better each and every episode. Done. Credits roll. Now, friend, this is after things, so let's go to the back of the store and let's have a real conversation. The wisest man in podcasting, Tom Merritt, has said and said to both of uh, all of us, I guess, uh, on this on this show, you get the chat room you deserve. Yep. So I'm not saying that you did anything. I'm saying that you need, if we're having a real talk, and I don't know anything. I don't know what your podcast is. I don't know what this guy's saying. I don't know whether or not he's totally out of pocket or anything. But if I was being really real with you, and I loved you, and I wanted you to succeed, I would begin with the idea of where did this conflict start? And have you done anything or is your content the kind of thing that is inviting and asking for this kind of stuff? Because by the way, these problems are not unique. The bigger you get, the more you will deal with it, the more you will realize, as Brian and I have with Night Attack, that if you build a brand on two bros, bro, 
joshing around with each other and, and a lot and of bringing up funny, funny things, then guess what? There's going to be a lot of people who don't have the emotional intelligence that two friends who have uh, done a, a show together for 10 years are going to bring up personal dumb stuff repeatedly because that's the, 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 the example that they have modeled. And that for us is a genie that's out of the bottle. <laughs> like, like <laughs> we we've attracted that audience. We're going to have to deal with it. it. It doesn't mean that, that we're, that, that it's bad, but it does mean that you have to focus on it. And especially if you're in a very, very embryonic stage and you're finding that, then it's, it is instructive to think about the product you're putting out. Yeah. And, and I'd say, even if we, I mean, you know, uh, reticence email says at, if we take at face value, uh, reticent saying, well, it's not constructive criticism or the, these are just, let's say that all of the, this Reddit is filled with this show is poopy pants. And that is the beginning and end of it. Like then if that's the case, then you need to swim around that, that, you know, if truly there is like not a kernel of truth to what you think is in there, then this is, a blip on a radar and go make your own subreddit and then never acknowledge it. But I think Justin's right. Like do consider like what, what got someone to that point? Because you know, like my experience is that podcast audiences aren't going to tell you why they're leaving. They're just going to stop listening there. Yeah. Uh, it, it is a, it is a, a, a slightly fickle audience and, 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 you might not ever be told that, oh, you know, actually uh, there's a buzz and I stopped listening because there's always a buzz in the in the episode or there's there's this or this that you're not you're you're more times than not not going to get that feedback. And maybe if there's a kernel to be uh, to be found with some introspection, I, I, I would co-sign Justin saying like eh, really give it a second thought uh, on that. Yeah, uh, the only the only way uh, I would diverge from what you just said is is um, I wouldn't. Uh, oftentimes, the the reason that they're bothering to make a subreddit is because they care so much about your show that they made a yeah. freaking subreddit Reddit about it. So so now yes, they happen to be caring in the exact wrong direction that you would like them to, but, but energy, uh, that enthusiasm is something that you can't manufacture. That's real. That comes from a real place. So I, I would not avoid it or sidestep it or refuse to acknowledge it or pretend it's not there. Uh, because if it's true energy and if you just get bigger, then this person is just gonna, you know, bang louder. Um, I, I, I would at least investigate whether or not this person in a weird way thinks they're helping because every heckler uh, I've ever, like, like number of hecklers who actually were there to damage my show, uh, vanishingly small, less than 1%. 99% of them thought they were helping by shouting out random crap during the entire show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, you were dealing with somebody with passion. Now, granted, there is a lesson about tending your garden. One of the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest regrets I have in... I mean, a decade plus uh, uh, of creating content on the internet was on the iTrix blog. I had a troll, and this guy would just comment on every single post, and he would uh, he would irritate everybody. And initially, I was like, "Well, look at these comments." Every time I post something, now there's twenty comments because this troll riles people up, and then. Uh, they all start fighting and then like, look at me. That's great. What I didn't realize is without tending that garden, without banning that person who was there in that comment section, I was effectively ceding it to that tenor. I co-authored the, the, the fact that that was now the way to communicate on you, my platform. You, you, you in a way that I didn't a style want guide to. without realizing it. Yep. Without realizing it. Now, Reddit's different because a podcast and a Reddit are not necessarily the same thing. You can you can say, hey, if you want to interact with the show, come on our Discord. You can say, if you want to interact with the show, then email me. You can you define with a podcast the places for which you want to interact with people. And if somebody creates a subreddit, good for them. They can create a Tumblr, I'm sure, still dedicated to your thing. It doesn't matter that people are necessarily going to go there podcasting and Reddit don't have that immediate, oh, I got to find it in the same way that like a podcast and a Twitter or something do. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if we're being really real and we like to do that on After Things, 
the first thing I would say is learn what you can out of this. And then at that point, improve your product. That's it. There you go. Uh, awesome. Well, I ho hopefully that was uh, um, helpful, uh, uh, Reticent. Uh, thank you for uh, sending in that question. Yeah. Yeah. This is a sneak attack edition because we have happy hour coming up in, in, in uh, 49 minutes or so. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, that'll do it. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of got a little short one here today. We got some time constraints, but, uh, uh, Brian and Justin, thank you for joining us here on after things. Thank you guys for sending in. If you've got a question like Reticent did, we've got email instructions in the podcast and description notes here. Um, but, uh, uh, until next time it's been after. See you. Heck yeah. All right. Uh, cool. Well, uh, thank you, Reticent, for sending that in. And thank you, everybody, for listening and, and tuning in on the live stream. The guys will be back in about 50 minutes uh, with a happy hour. Yep. First one in a minute. In a minute. That's right. First one of the year? No, yeah. you guys did one two weeks ago. Yeah. Or one week ago. I think we did it on New Year's. You did New Year's Day. Day. That's right. That's oh, right. yeah. yeah. We did week. New Year's Day. No, yeah, because I flew out the next day. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you were out of town a week ago. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, uh, everyone stay tuned for that. Uh, we'll be back then. And uh, Cord Killer's coming up a little later. We've got Bill Meeks on the show. That was yeah. fun. That'll be Ooh. 6 o'clock p.m. Central. And then Night Attack tomorrow. All right, everybody. Cool. Bye. See pew, pew, pew. Bye. Been a while since I've seen my face. Smiling at the thought of the wall.